Welcome to the No Quit Living Podcast. Our primary objective is to motivate and inspire our listeners to never quit. The reality of life is simple. We all fall. We all fail. At times, we get knocked down. The question is, do we get back up? Are we stronger? Are we better prepared to attain the maximum of our potential? Thank you for joining our No Quit Tribe. As you go for your greatness today, never quit. And remember, we rise by lifting others up. Welcome to episode number 358 of the No Quit Living Podcast. I'm your host, Christopher J. Worth, and today's theme of the day is learning. Our quote of the day comes to us from Henry Ford. Anyone who keeps learning stays young. If you are looking to take either your personal or professional life to the next level, we would love it if you took a look at our new planner, the Clear Planner. It will help improve your systems, routines, and habits. Head on over to theclearplanner.com. I had a lot of fun recording today's podcast. After I read his new book, The Secret Society of Success, I was excited to speak with Tim Schurer. He shares a ton of great stuff, and I hope you enjoy today's episode. Tim, I'd like to welcome you to the No Quit Living podcast. Man, thanks for having me. I'm pumped. It's going to be fun. I appreciate it. So full and fair disclosure before we start this, Tim and I spoke for probably four or five minutes about Kansas University, Jayhawks, (laughs) Rock Chalk. So full and fair disclosure for any Kansas State fans or any other Big 12 schools, you might want to uh, maybe turn this off. (laughs) There is. So I, I live in Nashville, but I still have family in Kansas City and Kansas City is where I grew up. And every time I make that drive, I have to drive through Columbia, Missouri, which is where the University of Missouri is. And now that they're in the SEC, there doesn't really seem to be as much of a rivalry, but there's still a rivalry in my heart. And I'm just like, gosh, I just hate that I have to drive through Columbia. I love I love the 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 rivalry and that competitiveness. It's so fun. So if there are any Mizzou fans out there, I just don't understand why you guys don't convert because clearly the Jayhawks is the better choice. Shots fired. I think there's no better way to, <laughs> to start this. So for any podcast listeners that are uh, Mizzou fans, please uh, make sure you forward this over to them. And we'll, we'd love to have some some new followers. <laughs> The first question, Tim, I ask everybody is if you've had a no-quit story of your own or perhaps a really challenging time personally or professionally where you could have given up or given in, but you didn't. Yeah. You know, working on a book is actually a project where you just got to put a little something on the plot. And, you know, what I think is true about a book is as true in life. There are going to be ups and downs. It is going to be very hard. The most important thing is in all of that, you just wake up and try to get a little bit better every single day. And, you know, there's something that I've been talking about with some friends recently, and I just heard it from a guy named Lieutenant Colonel Dan Rooney, who's a, a fighter pilot. And he says he has this book called Fly Into the Wind. And fighter jets take off flying into the wind. Why? He says, because you need resistance to ascend. Mm. And there's something that I have learned about success from a lot of people that have had success at the highest level. And it's a little surprising to me when I really started to, to discover this. So much of what has made them successful is failure. It's their response to all of these things. and. I used to believe that success was this line, you know, up and to the right. And like to experience success, there's no failure, there's no setbacks. And I don't believe that anymore. And and somebody who's had a pretty big influence on my life is Scott Hamilton. He's a a friend, lives here in Nashville. He won an Olympic gold medal in, in figure skating. And I asked him one time, you know, what about all of this? And, and he said, what if we started to look at failure as 100% information? What if it's just information? And so it's in those hard moments. It's in that, man, I want to quit, but I'm just looking at failure and these setbacks a little bit differently. It's information. It's we need resistance to ascend. 
And I think that puts me in a much better headspace to approach everything that I am up against in my life or in my career. I, I appreciate you you touching on that. And I think not only what you just scared about shared about Scott, but I think in society, we look at everybody's highlight reel. And I think what social media doesn't do a good job is it it highlights your best of the best, you know, my best podcast ever or your best book or your best sports event. And in no way do I want to knock those. But I think what you just shared is so important is I think in today's day and age, people are looking at failure as a good thing, not wanting or looking to fail. But as you do fail, that very next step is what can I learn? What can I do better? What can I do differently? And then if and when you encounter that same obstacle or challenge or game, whether it's the next game or or a week or two down the road, you've now learned and become a better version of yourself. And I think it's just so powerful. But I think, and I'm curious to get your your perspective on this, but I see so many people now really focusing on what I've learned from failure and how I can look at it as opposed to, and a quote that I share all the time by Zig Ziglar is, failure is an event, not a person. But I wanted to just yeah. maybe have you unpack that for a second, because I think it's really important how we all look at failure. There's a, a golfer named Ben Crane, and he asked himself three questions at the end of every round of golf. It's what did I do well? What did I learn? And how can I act on what I learned? The most interesting question for me is that second one. Because most people, if you really break this down, they'd say, okay, what did I do well? The second question you would want to think would be, what did I not do well? But that's not what he says. It's what did I learn? Which is putting us into that positive headspace because he's learned so much of how he manages his mental game from Lainey Basham and this whole mental model, which is the more you fixate on the negative, the more likely you are to repeat it. But if we can look at our failures as lessons, we actually are more likely to achieve the same kind of positive results that we're aiming for. What did I do well? What did I learn? How can I act on what I learned? Which means that even our failures, the things we don't do well, can become our greatest lessons. And so what I have started to do is to think more about things like that. So are we willing to be vulnerable enough, authentic enough to talk about some of those failures? Because there's this temptation for us to present that one version of ourselves, which is the, you know, buttoned up, I've already overcome it. That is what people want to see from people that they admire a lot of times. But I think if we're honest, we actually want to hear about the failure. We want to, we want to find out how some of these people that we aspire to be like, we want to hear how they've navigated their challenges. Because if we become the greatest versions of ourselves through challenge, and if challenge is inevitable for all of us, why wouldn't we want to learn how really successful people have navigated it? So I think the challenge for all of us is let's actually be vulnerable enough to talk about some of our failures, but how can we stay in that positive headspace, start to look at those failures as lessons? And here has been where I've gotten to because of these really hard things that I've had to navigate. I think if we show up that way, we're going to get some attention because most people aren't wanting to be public about some of these things. I, I could not agree more with that. And and I know that my personal coach, a gentleman by the name of Brian Kane, he's really opened my eyes about the concept of reflection. And he asks himself three questions, start, stop, and continue. What do I need to start? What do I need to stop? And what do I need to continue? And I think it's the same three questions that you shared about Ben Crane, which if if I could share something with the listeners, it's the idea of reflecting back on those things that didn't go the way you wanted, the games you lost, maybe the sales you didn't make, but it's those lessons within them that make you a better person. And I, I'm glad you you touched on that, which leads me to your book, The Secret Society of Success. And I want to read the the bottom, I guess, subtitle of, if you call it, Stop Chasing the Spotlight and Learn to Enjoy Your Work and Life Again. I was super excited to to read this because I just, I definitely 
look at different things as far as the titles, the covers. So this one stood out. But when once I dove into it, as I shared with you offline, there was just so much to unpack. But maybe a challenging question, but what what led you to really go after this book and this concept and attack it the way you did? So I'll start with this story because I think it's really helpful in just framing up some of this and really my journey to start to think about success in the way that I, I do now. A lot of people are familiar with this story of Apollo 11, you know, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, that whole thing, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. But what's fascinating to me is a lot of people don't know there's a third astronaut on that mission. Michael Collins was his name. And the guy Ubers Neil and Buzz to the moon. He, he actually gets them there, drops them off. He then stays back in the command module and orbits the moon something like 26 times until those guys are ready to be picked up and brought back to Earth. And what would make this a miserable story would be if Michael were to get back from this mission, sit down with the press and say something like, well, it sure would have been nice to actually walk on the moon. And you know, in, in some way acted like a victim and, and in doing so tried to take the spotlight from the mission as a whole. But what I love so much about the story is he did not respond that way. He sits down with the press and talks about how content he was to have had one of those three seats. And so as you think about that story and also about what we are up against in culture today, we look at success as stepping into the spotlight climbing the ladder, being the boss, having fame, money, and power. This is what we are told success is. But the question that I have for us is, do we have to walk on the moon to be happy? Because in my life, the journey that I've been on, I tried to get into the spotlight. There was a season in my life when I wanted to be the next John Mayer. Everything that I was doing was to get me closer to that status of, you know, that fame status. And spoiler alert, it did not work. <laughs> I did not become the next John Mayer. But the more and more removed I became from the spotlight, and actually, as I stepped into roles behind the scenes, supporting other people, supporting a mission, that is actually when I started to feel that fulfillment. And that connection to the work that I had not felt up to that point. And so I just no longer believe that success is only this certain group of things. It's not fame. It's not money. It's not power. So if it's not that, what is it? And so the Secret Society of Success is this group of people I've discovered that have shown me this new way to live, this new way to define success that's counter to what culture is selling. And if we can learn to define success in the ways that they do, the secret society of success, I just think we'll be on a much better path. So it, I'm glad you shared that story. I wasn't sure if that's the story you were going to go with, but that that is a story early on in your book that really stood out to me. And, and I have to admit that I had no idea that there was a third person. So <laughs> as I'm reading this story, you know, you share the first name. I say, okay, I remember him. You share the second name. I'm like, yep, I, I remember not only reading about that, but talking about it. Then you went into the third gentleman, and I was like, all right, this is definitely going to be a fictitious story that at the end has some fable or, or some <laughs> some curveball coming through it. But I went ahead and, and Googled it just because I was curious about some of those comments, and, and you're spot on. And I think so many people, so many companies, so many – Famous people, not famous people, are the ones that are behind the scenes that are doing those things that make something like that happen. And they sometimes don't ever get any of the notoriety or the recognition, but it's that's not what it's about. So I love, love that story. And going into the, the concept of success, something that we often ask each guest and not every single guest, but is how do you personally define success or what does success mean to you? But you use a word in that in the last answer that has come up quite a bit. It's fulfillment. And I think that's something that the first, I think, one or two answers I heard from a guest, you know, my I raised my eyebrows, like, okay, it kind of makes sense to me, but it's so much more than than just money or just fame. So I'm 
dying to get your your definition of what success means to you or how do you personally define success? So if I were to fill in the blank, success is, um, the way I would answer it now is very different than what I used to. Um, but today I would say success is helping others win. The people that I've been inspired by the most are people who are willing to kind of set aside their own agendas and they're willing to just serve alongside somebody else. And that idea of helping others win is just so powerful to me. And I know we're talking about Jayhawk basketball a little bit earlier, so I'll lean into this whole basketball idea. Somebody who I've actually learned a lot from is LeBron James. So in 2020, LeBron and the Lakers won the NBA Finals. So LeBron's one of the greatest basketball players of all time. You'd think a guy like that would want to be the scoring leader in the NBA, you know, score more than everyone else. But what's interesting to me is in 2020, LeBron didn't lead the NBA in scoring. He led the league in assists, meaning that the way he chose to play and ultimately how he and his team won was by him setting his teammates up to score. What if? success is in the assist. What if we started to look at our lives, our careers, how we show up through the lens of assisting others? And I think it's important to note here that I think a lot of people would say to be in the secret society, you may think you need to be in a supporting role, but LeBron is actually a perfect example of someone who lives in the way of the secret society, and yet he couldn't be any more in the spotlight. So the lesson here is being in the secret society has less to do with your position on the org chart or the amount of visibility you have in your role, and it's more about the way in which you show up, the posture of your heart and your mind towards how you do your work and what your motivation is. And the people that I really want to be like, how I want to model my career, I want to be somebody who views success as assisting others and helping others win. It's, it's so cool that you, that you touched on that LeBron story because as I was reading your book, I completely forgot that he led the league in assists that year. I know that they went on to win the NBA championship, and that was that interesting year where they start they started the season and they stopped at midway, and then I think there was like a ninety one day, or I forget how many yeah, days, but huge, then a hiatus, they went on yeah. to to complete that season, and they went ahead and and won. So I'm glad you touched on that because I think LeBron realized at that point whether it was part pandemic, part the team he had, he needed to take a different role a different ownership if they were going to win the championship now I can't tell you if he had averaged 35 points a game that year they would have went ahead and lost or not even made the playoffs but something within himself and also the team structure realized that okay I need to lead in a different way and it leads me to uh, another question that I I found fascinating in your book is you there's a a part that's titled create a culture of recognition. And we do a lot of work with culture, the word culture, whether we're working with sports teams or coaches or companies. And I think the concept of culture is is pretty self-explanatory, but the concept of recognition is something that I think people miss, miss the target with. And for me, I ask a lot of my clients, what are the one or two main reasons why people leave a company? And it's not just money. It's not you know, getting further in the company, a big thing is is recognition, being acknowledged and feeling appreciated. And that's where I think so many people miss miss the boat where they say, well, the reason that Tim left was because, you know, another company offered him, you know, X amount of dollars. And yeah, that those things are are enticing, but it comes down to recognition, acknowledgement, and feeling like you're part of a team. So love for you to to touch on that for a second because I love that that culture of recognition. Yeah. So somebody that I've learned a ton from over the last few months is a guy named David Novak. And I was able to interview David on my podcast. Uh, It's called Build a Winning Team. And David 
is the co-founder and former CEO of Yum Brands. And they're the parent corporation for KFC, Taco Bell, and Pizza Hut. So in David's tenure as CEO, he actually grew the business from $4 billion to $32 billion. How? By creating a culture of recognition where everyone felt like they counted and that they mattered. And so a lot of people look at something like recognition as fluffy stuff, right? Surely this is not the kind of thing that can really drive results for the business. Well, David would have a very different thought on that. He says it's the soft stuff that drives the hard results. And so I've been up to his office in Louisville. He's no longer the CEO, but they still have his office exactly like it was when he was CEO. So I was up there a month or two ago and on the wall, you'll see all these pictures of David and these team members. So what he would do is he identified the behaviors that really would drive results in the business. And then he recognized those behaviors. So he would, if, if quality was one of their you know, drivers, if he saw, caught somebody you know, at, at KFC, he's like, you, you make an amazing original recipe. You know, it's the quality that you continue to prioritize, that you continue to prioritize that really drives the results in this place. He'd give them what he called a personal recognition award. And he said, I'm going to take a picture with you. I'll send you a copy of this picture. But the version that I'm going to take, I'm going to put on the wall in my office because I want to show people you're the kind of person that's really making stuff happen around here. Well, David had so many pictures that he ran out of space on the walls. He started to put them on the ceiling. That's awesome. And so, you know, as he even was creating Yum!, they went around to all of the different businesses that were really doing amazing things, the Targets, the, the Walmarts, and they wanted to do the things that really could drive long-term success. And he said the number one thing that all of these companies had in common was they were in cultures and they created environments where everyone counted. And it's crazy because it feels like if you think about this analogy of a concert, we need the person standing in the center of the stage for the whole thing to work. That is not the problem. The problem is when we think that the center stage position is the only role that matters. Because for these things to function, for Apollo 11 to exist, we needed Neil and Buzz and Michael all doing their part with excellence. So I think the lesson for all of us is, what if we stopped trying to chase that one position and instead got so obsessed in doing our part and, and playing our role with excellence? Imagine the kind of thing that could happen. But then not only that, what if we started to recognize the people who were doing their part and doing it really well? And we started to look at success as each of us playing a role on the team, because the reality is we all do play a role on a team and every role counts, every role matters. And if we can start to learn to recognize one another for doing that work, I think we are going to create really healthy company cultures. It's so neat when you take a company like Yum Brands and like you said, a parent company of, of some very successful companies, but it's not about these huge trophies and these big giant checks that that really drove some of that success. It's the little things like taking a picture and putting up on a wall. It's recognizing or acknowledging people. And, and to your point, it's making everybody feel that they are a part of something. And it's not about being a center of attention always, but without that center person and the side person and the person behind them, it doesn't work. So yes, sometimes people get different different accolades by being the best player or being the loudest or the best singer, but it's all those people behind and you talk about your John Mayer aspirations. You know, John Mayer stands up front and he sings, but it's all the people that are behind and then when you release an album, it's people that edit it, people that produce it, people that do all those things and and when we step into our role and want to do it at a level of excellence that's where 
greatness happens. So I, I love that. I think we could probably touch on that for, for a couple hours. But interesting question we ask everybody, and you can't use your book. So I'm curious if you've read something recently or if you're currently reading something that you'd like to recommend to our listeners. Read David Novak's book, Taking People With You, because he models so brilliantly what a leader looks like that sees himself in that servant position, right? Leading with that posture of needing the entire team to really make this whole thing work. I, it's, it's remarkable. I, I love that book and I, I really love everything that David stands for. It's a great book. He he's written another book after that, I believe. I I don't think yeah. I've read that one. Do you know the title? He of that just one? wrote a book. He just wrote a book that came out in March called "Take Charge of You: How Self Coaching Can Transform Your Life and Career." And he wrote it with Jason Goldsmith, who's a sports performance coach and has worked with golfers like Jason Day, um, Justin Rose, get to number one in the world. So it's a a, a really great book and also super helpful just when you think about some of these little real tangible things that you can apply to your life and business. I've, I really enjoyed that one too. And I think the, the concept of, of self-coaching comes into the concept we talked about, which is asking those, those three questions that Ben Crane did, but also yeah. the reflection of how can I get better? How can I improve? And, and how can yeah. I act upon this? So I know you know that famous Jim Rohn quote, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. If I could grant you dinner with any five people to level up with dead or alive, who would you pick? Jim Nance. um, Scott Hamilton. David Novak. Oh my gosh. These last two. I'm like looking at my shelf for books to think of all the people who have been super inspiring. You spit out the first three really quickly. So now we're going to challenge you to, to bring them the last two. This is important to me. I want to say the right the right things. Here's another person, Becca Stevens, who a lot of people have not heard of. Um, she started an organization called Thistle Farms, which has helped women get off the streets from prostitution, drug addiction, trafficking. And she lives through this lens of like helping one life at a time. And I just want to... I. I know her, but I, I want to just sit at a table with her because I really want to continue learning from everything that she is all about. One more person, Tim Cook. Tim Cook. Tim Cook. She's in your yeah. book, so that's the only reason why I, why I knew her. I, I don't think oh. two weeks ago I would have known who she was, so I have uh, the advantage there. We're going to switch over to what we call our hot seat questions, and the only request we have of you is you spit out the first thing that comes to mind. Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> Last meal, you can pick absolutely anything. What do you pick? I'll have a ribeye steak with some mashed potatoes. Favorite smell? Favorite smell? Lavender? <laughs> the way you said that with the look on your face, like lav- there's like a... I think, a I think it's lavender. Answer. Yeah, I wasn't that... Con- you said first thing that popped into my mind, so I'm like, I have to say this, but also, is it? Okay, we'll just roll with it. It's lavender. I'll, there you go. Favorite sport? Golf. Do you have an all-time favorite team? Jayhawks. Are they Are they good? I've never heard of them. <laughs> favorite movie? It's a great year to be a Jayhawk. I'll just say that. Yes. My favorite movie, La La Land. Chase you, your dreams. Favorite book? Uh, a Million Miles in a Thousand Years by Donald Miller. Do you have a favorite app that you use on your phone? Five Minute Journal. Oh, hang on. Okay, it's between these two. I'm so sorry. These are both really um, important ones. I love them both. Um, the Five Minute Journal, which you know, it's you're writing down things that you're grateful for. But another one that I love, it's called One Second Every Day. So I take a, a second of video or like five seconds but the app lets you actually cut out one second. So it's like a video diary of, you know, entire year is in six minutes. And I've been doing this for eight years. No joke. Eight years. One second. I wish everyone could sit. I wish everyone could see this. I'm showing you this like on video because you and I are on video. 
but that's, that's really it's, cool. It, it, it one second is just long enough for you to to just remember all these little things that you've done. That is really um, cool. I love it. it. Yeah, I'm gonna check that out. What is the background picture on your phone? Oh, uh, my kids. Do you have a favorite quote? Do I have a favorite quote? I do have a favorite quote. Can I'm gonna share it at the end. Okay. Can I share as my yep. final thought? It's my favorite quote. I'm going to share it at the end. And what is that one song, no matter whenever you hear it, morning, afternoon, or evening, you automatically turn it up and rock out to it? Ooh. So my my kids have this song that they call Dance Party. It's a great song, um, but it's called, oh my gosh, hang on. They call it Dance Party because we do have this dance party. It's called Thank You, Lord by Chris Tomlin. It's a great one. You got it's got Thomas Rhett, Florida Georgia Line. It's got you know, it's got a beat to it. Check it I, out. It's a good I, one. I love it. I definitely will have to check that out. And for our listeners that want to either connect with you, find out more about you, and also your your podcast and book, what's the best way for them to do so? And are you active on social media? Yeah. So Instagram, if you just search my name at Tim Sure, you're going to have to look at the title in this episode to know how to spell it. <laughs> so sorry, but all the links uh, for all the things that I do, buildawinningteam.com. I love it. And last question we ask everybody and, and we'll ask you is if you have any parting words you'd like to leave with our listeners today. All right. So if there's been a North Star for me as I was working on this book, and you know, it, truly, it's going to continue to be a North Star just because of how impactful this has been. Albert Schweitzer says, I don't know what your destiny will be. Some of you will perhaps occupy remarkable positions. Perhaps some of you will become famous by your pens or as artists. But I know one thing. The only ones among you who will be really happy are those who have sought and found how to serve. And to me, that's it. Right. Like if we become the people that show up like that, that are all about the assist, that start to look at our failures and our challenges as lessons. If we actually set ourselves up to help others win, I just feel like if we position ourselves that way, uh, I just think we're going to be on a, a much, much better path and a fulfilling path for sure. I think that's a awesome way to end today's episode. For our listeners, make sure you check out, get a copy of Tim's new book. I think you will absolutely love it and check his podcast out. And Tim, I appreciate your time and I hope that you and I can connect again soon. Oh man, thank you so much for having me. I loved it. Go Jayhawks. Thank you for listening to episode number 358. Tim shared the golfer Ben Crane's three reflection questions, and I wanted to repeat them for you. Number one, what did I do well? Number two, what did I learn? And number three, what am I going to do about what I learned? My challenge to you today to finish today's episode is very simple. I challenge each of you to think about those three reflection questions and think about how you could implement them in your own personal or professional life. And remember, we rise by lifting others up. And lastly, to our listeners, thank you. We truly appreciate your time, and we hope our episodes inspire you to keep on attacking life and never giving up. To quote Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, it's always too early to quit.